The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today, we'll update you what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we go front and center discussing sickle cell disease, the signs, the symptoms, and how to diagnose it. Afterwards, we'll talk about how the Bronx Neighborhood Housing Services, CDC, is providing some much needed resources to stabilize communities. Then we'll discuss the recent Bronx Fit Fest and why health screenings are an important part of maintaining a good health. And then also we'll talk about a, me a medical diagnostics and solutions company that's engineering some life-saving diagnostic solutions. We'll give you more details on that a little bit later on in the show. And then finally, We'll learn about a partnership with the New York Yankees and T-Mobile, helping New York City students. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. I'm Darren Jaime and welcome to Open. Today is Wednesday, October 6th. You're watching Open, a live and interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. We encourage you to stay connected to us on our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV. And please don't forget to visit our website at Bronxnet.org. Well, a lot has been going on through the course of the past week. We'll take you through a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start with state news. New York State Governor Kathy Hochul has announced signing an executive order permitting virtual court hearings to be conducted at the jail instead of risking transporting prisoners. Now, the governor greenlighted legislation permitting the transfer of over 100 inmates from city-run Rikers to state facilities aimed at creating more space within the 6,000-person lockup amidst reports of escalating violence, deteriorating living conditions, and severe staffing shortages. Earlier last month, Governor Hockle signed a bill into law allowing the early release of individuals behind bars because of technical parole violations. Now, although the new law does not take effect until early 2022, the governor said the expedited move was necessary to help alleviate overcrowding issues. In other news, the New York City Small Business Services continues to work with about 70% of Bronx businesses impacted by flooding from Hurricane Ida. Our Bronx Net reporter Arlene Makoko was on the streets. She brings us this story right now. Following her. Meet Bernadette Nation, Executive Director of Small Business Services, Emergency Response, and Intergovernmental Services, working on the ground here at the 161st Street Business Improvement District near Jerome Avenue. Weeks after Hurricane Ida swept through the tri-state area, causing catastrophic flooding. Probably a second-hand furniture store. Really? My staff are there right now. Out of about 600 businesses affected citywide, with the majority in Brooklyn and Queens, about 70 cases are in the Bronx, which include one in this community that lost 80,000 in merchandise after a basement flooded. Nation shared their work begins with assessing the level of damage by placing the businesses in one of two categories. Minimal impact dealt with less than a foot of water in their commercial space. That critical impact was more than a foot of water in their basements or in their ground level space. And that would ruin their perishables, their equipment, 
such as freezers and, and ovens and, uh, and electrical equipment like computers if they have their office in the basement. Then it's about connecting the business owners with resources available. Meanwhile, on Kingsbridge Road, this barbershop manager showed they did okay sharing the one to two inches of water was so minimal there was no impact. Next door at New Capital Restaurant, though, where on a rainy day their takeout service increases, everything came to a standstill. We had to stop the, all deliveries because it was just too crazy outside. It was the, the rain was nonstop, it was heavy, and it was just too much for someone to go out in that weather. Nation says businesses with questions can dial 311 and ask for small business services or go to nyc.gov slash SBS. For damage to residential property, you can call FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency at 1-800-621-FEMA. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. That's all the time we have for our Bronx updates, but we're not out of show. We encourage you to stay with us. Coming up after the break, Oprah will continue right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And welcome back. In the United States, approximately 100,000 people live with sickle cell disease, with about 10% of those living actually in New York State. Millions of people do not know they have sickle cell disease because the trait usually doesn't cause illness. That's why it's important to be tested. Signs and symptoms of sickle cell anemia vary from person to person and can change over time. Joining us to share more details about, the, uh, about this is the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Director of, Sis Director of the Sickle Cell Program at Montefiore Medical Center, Dr. Carrie Marone. And uh, Dr. Marone, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, glad to have you. Now, when we talk about sickle cell, as we said, you know, about 10% of people in the state of New York are really dealing with sickle cell. But for somebody who may not be so familiar, give us a background as to exactly what is sickle cell. Yes. So sickle cell disease is a condition in which you're born with. It's inherited. Your parents will pass down two different traits um, and you will have uh, this sickle cell disease, of which there are many different types of forms. And it's a blood disorder. So what it is, is red blood typically these nice round red blood cells. And with sickle cell disease, the cells itself turn into like a C shape when it goes under times of stress or low oxygen in your body. And this can affect your entire body. Um, obviously from birth until adulthood, you have this condition your entire life once you um, are diagnosed with it at birth. And the condition um, really needs to be monitored closely by a hematologist a pediatric hematologist like myself in childhood and into the adulthood with the adult hematologist because there are many different uh, complications that we have to monitor for. Patients with sickle cell, sickle cell disease are at increased risk for infection. They have often pain episodes because if you can imagine these sickle cells that are C-shaped, they can get clogged into the blood vessels and can cause um, extreme pain at times in which our patients have to visit the emergency department. They have to be hospital at times. Our patients are at increased risk for vision loss, are at increased risk for having strokes. There are many different complications we have to monitor for, and it's so important that everyone know their uh, trait status and that they know if they have the condition. Yeah. And so when we talk about diagnosis, how hard is it to really come up with a diagnosis for sickle cell? Is it pretty easy to figure out if a person does have it? Yeah. So now uh, in all the states in America um, at birth, children will be screened for uh, sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease. So when the babies are first born, there's a little bit of blood that's drawn and sent to um, the state registry, which they um, can easily find out in a couple of weeks. 
And then and as an adult or a, a child, if you don't know your uh, trait status or your sickle cell disease status, you can go to um, your doctor and ask for a blood test. It's actually a pretty uh, simple um, blood test that they can just draw. And then if there's concerns, then they can refer you to a, a blood specialist like myself. Yeah. Sometimes people do not find out that they have sickle cell until they encounter certain kinds of medical problems. What are the medical problems that actually accompany sickle cell? So the most common um, is pain. Um, those sickle cells that are brought up that are abnormally shaped, they are floating all throughout your body and they um, can uh, cause uh, pain at times in which people are under stress, if they have infections. Um, if they encounter cold temperatures, um, if they get dehydrated, um, if they um, have other illnesses that are going on in their life that are also getting worse, that can all trigger their sickle cells to then misshape more and cause more symptoms. So pain is the number one symptom for our patients. Uh, and it can happen very suddenly out of the blue. We don't even expect anything. And then that will lead to a painful episode in which you have to go to the emergency department or you have to go to um, be admitted to the hospital. So it's important to monitor your own body and, and know how you're feeling. Um, also importantly, because these sickle cells affect everywhere, it also affects the spleen, which is an organ underneath your ribs and your spleen helps protect against infections. And so the spleen with sickle cell disease doesn't function so well because those sickle cells get all clogged in there. And so you are increased risk for infections as a child and even into adulthood. So our patients need extra vaccines. They need to see a doctor right away if they have a fever and to get antibiotics and screen for other more serious infections. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other complications, but just a couple of those I wanna highlight is um, in particular stroke. So our patients with sickle cell disease are at increased risk for stroke from childhood into adulthood. And so there's certain screening um, ultrasounds that we do every year for our young patients to make sure that uh, we know their risk factors um, for stroke. And school performance is another um, big issue that we wanna highlight to our families to, to bring up to their doctors is that if your children are having difficulty in school, sickle cell disease could play a factor in that. It can affect your brain in other ways. And so we try to support our families um, in many other ways. And we do screening tests for other things like your liver, your heart, um, uh, your eyes to make sure that we look for other complications with that because it really affects every organ. And so we have to closely monitor it throughout their lifehood. So yeah. And so once a person is diagnosed and they do have sickle cell, obviously the question comes about treatment and cure. Uh, first, let's tackle the issue of treatment. How is it treated? Yes, so there's different treatments and I think of it as acute treatments, like when you get sick and then treatments for preventative measures. So when someone has a, a pain episode or has a fever, you have to go to your doctor right away to see if you need antibiotics, to get pain management, to get appropriate fluids. Sometimes you might need a blood transfusion. And so these are things that we do acutely. Um, for prevention, as I mentioned, there are increases for infection. So we wanna make sure we give the appropriate vaccines that we give um, antibiotics such as penicillin um, in their childhood years to prevent infection. And then there are different medications um, that are actually now approved by the FDA for children and adults with sickle cell disease. There are four drugs right now that are FDA approved, um, hydroxyurea, Endari, Oxbrita, and Adexio. I would say um, hydroxyurea is the longest studied but we can start um, as young as nine months uh, to 12 months of age. The other ones are a little bit newer, but very exciting that we have new FDA approved drugs and there's different indications for all of them. Some of them are by mouth, some of them are um, through an intravenous um, way, but it, there are different um, treatments now that we can provide for our patients to help keep them healthy from the complications of sickle cell disease. Because of course we have to treat when they're acutely ill. We also wanna keep them as healthy as we can to keep them out of the hospital. Um, in terms of cure, the cure right now, um, the only cure that we know works um, is a bone marrow transplant. And a bone marrow transplant um, is basically these cells in your body, these like fatty cells in your body, um, they end up getting replaced by someone else's bone marrow because the bone marrow itself has lots of different cells, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelets, and we have to find an appropriate match so we can replace your bone marrow which makes all these different cells with someone else's bone marrow. And right now a brother or sister match um, bone marrow transplant is sort of the standard of care. If you have a, a brother or sister match, 
that um, is something I would definitely talk about with your sickle cell doctor if that would be the right treatment option for you. And there are other studies uh, ongoing to look at if there are other matches from other people that are related or unrelated, um, uh, as well as uh, gene therapy is also uh, being investigated right now as a different option. So there's a lot of on, ongoing investigation into uh, different therapies. And we know the big conversation right now is about the vaccine and how people are encouraged to get vaccinated. How does the vaccine play out in the life of those who've been affected by sickle cell? Yes. So we um, encourage everyone who is eligible for the vaccine um, to consider getting the vaccine because we know that patients with sickle cell disease are immunocompromised. And so they are um, at increased risk for complications from getting coronavirus. Uh, we recently published a paper um, of our patients in the Bronx and showed that there was about four times increased risk of being um, in the emergency department if you had sickle cell disease and coronavirus and seven times increased risk for being hospitalized. So those are all complications we wanna to try to avoid for our patients. The Sickle Cell um, Disease Society of America also agrees that um, patients that are eligible to receive the coronavirus vaccine should definitely um, receive it. And that mask wearing, hand washing, all the appropriate measures to keep yourself safe um, to continue. And you know, we wanna make sure that our patients uh, with sickle cell disease take the appropriate precautions um, because getting sick with sickle cell disease is a very different situation than someone who is, uh, does not have the disease. Yeah, and so curable, is that yes or no? So there is a cure for some patients with sickle cell disease if they have the uh, appropriate donor for bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, not everyone has the appropriate donor to do a brother or sister bone marrow transplant um, right now. And so that is why there are other uh, research studies looking at bone marrow transplants from other people, like if you're not related or if you're related but are not a full match to your immune system. So those are all studies right now, as well as gene therapy is an ongoing study. Um, so we're hopeful that there are more cures for patients that don't have a brother or sister match, but that's the, the only um, known uh, transplant that is, uh, is safe. Yeah. Well, Dr. Kerry Marone, thank you so much for being with us, sharing so much about sickle cell. Very important that we raise awareness, and I think we did that today. So thank you for being with us here on Open. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All righty. Well, we want to let you know if you want more information, we encourage you to visit the website at EinsteinMed.org and Montefiore.org. We do have more show coming up, so don't go anywhere. Open continues right after this. to the show, Bronx Neighborhood Housing Services, CDC, is a not-for-profit organization that is providing financial pre- and post-education of purchases, mortgage facilitation, affordable loans, as well as free tax services. Now, the mission of the group is to provide essential services to revitalize communities and address emerging needs while empowering our residents to achieve self-sufficiency. Joining us now to share more about the organization is Executive Director Oscar Murillo and also Community Engagement Coordinator Christian Campana. And uh, thank you both for joining us. Thank you, thank you for inviting us. Thank you, thank you so glad, much. Glad to have you. And uh, really the work, as I said earlier, is really about helping people really get back on their feet and really be able to get to a place of home ownership and really being able to have some self-sufficiency. So share a little bit more about your organization. Okay, the Bronx NHS, we have been, we have been serving the community for over 35 years. Uh, in our main uh, uh, 
services are housing related, home ownership. Uh, we help first time home buyer to buy the first home and uh, by providing them with education counseling and also by providing them with down payment and closing cost grant for down payment and closing cost because we you know most of the people that we serve face a situation that they can pay the mortgage but it's very hard for them to save enough money for down payment and closing cost so we help them by getting them a grant that is a forgivable loan they don't have to pay the money back through the city of new york and from the state of new york so they can they can buy they can pay for the down payment and they can and they can buy the property. After that, you know they continue to pay for the mortgage. After they become a homeowner, then we help them to maintain the property by providing them with additional grants that they don't have to pay back to fix the house and and provide also a grapes to the property. If they can after they are homeowner, also if they if they have issues paying the mortgage loan, we work with them. We provide education and counseling, and so that. And we negotiate with the mortgage servicers, the, 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 the bank that owns the loan, so that we can modify those loans, uh, especially when the, when the homeowners have lost some kind of income for, for emergency situation, we help them to uh, renegotiate those loans and avoid foreclosure. So yeah. those like in general for home ownership. And when you talk about home ownership, Christian, obviously it's an American dream for a lot of people. And sometimes having access to being able to really get on your feet is a hard thing to do. And so I know a part of preparation is getting these people involved in the programs. Talk about how a person qualifies to actually be a part of these programs. So as you said, uh, it is a dream, but uh, the most important for everything is education. So the main thing that we're doing here is uh, providing that education to all of the people who want to access these grants. And I just want to clarify uh, what Oscar said. It's just not that the person who applied at the beginning is the only person who qualifies for all these programs. Uh, any homeowner at this moment, like for example, if they want now to apply for a repair grant, it could come here and apply for the repair grant. The same thing if they went through all that and now they're facing some problems with foreclosure, it does, they didn't have to, purchase that house through here, but they could come here for help to prevent any foreclosure. So everything is about education and we have all these classes to provide them with that type of information. Right. Yeah. And I'm also made aware that you have an excluded workers fund. How does that work for, uh, for people? Yeah. So the excluded workers fund is being managed by New York State Department of Labor. Um, people who qualify may, may be able to get up to uh, a, $15,600 from the, from, the, from the state of New York Department of Labor. So they qualify if they, if they meet the following, the following requirements. They were not uh, eligible to get unemployment for whatever reason. So they, uh, they, they, they didn't receive uh, uh, any of the stimulus so, uh, uh, for whatever reason. They, 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 lost, they lost income during the pandemic. They say between 2020 and 2021. And they, don't, they didn't make more than $26,208. Of course, also they have, they, 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 they are expected to live in New York City. Let's say for the past year, they were living in New York State. Let's put it that way. So if they have these four conditions, if they can meet these four requirements, then they qualify. They come to us and we, and we help them to fill out the application and submit it to the Department of Labor. It is a, it is a, a simple a, a process for the application, yes. mainly it's for people who did not uh, receive any unemployment. And with this, we're talking about mainly, not only, but mainly the undocumented, uh, undocumented community. So all of them who were unable to, to apply for unemployment benefits, now with this program, they are able to obtain some help, yes. which yeah. we have helped so many people already submitting the, the application and they have been receiving the benefits. I know you got a lot of people coming through your doors and I want you to share a little bit because uh, during this time, a lot of us are still trying to navigate coming out of COVID. And for those people who rent, we know it's been a challenge. There's also the emergency rental assistance program. Mm -hmm. I know that you guys got a hand in that as well. How is that working and uh, what's, what, 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 what's going on there? That is also another program that we're receiving a lot of uh, clients and helping a lot of people with. This is a, 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 not only with rental, but also utilities. So at the moment that, for example, if the person wasn't able to pay the rent, 
need their utilities, we send both applications at the same time. Uh, so basically what we just require is proof that this actually happened because in the past there have been fraud. So we just need to make sure that we compile with, uh, with the requirements that uh, are asked. Um, so yeah, we are, uh, you have to show us, and it's not only the tenant, but we also need information through the landlord. Uh, so it's a two way type of application is tenant and landlord part. Um, then we, they just need to provide information, how many months, a lease, and then if they need help also with utilities, then they will have to provide an account number so we can submit that and see what's the, the process if they get approved or not. Just out of curiosity, about how many people are you seeing coming through your doors during a time like this? Because I know uh, the need is heavy, particularly in our borough. I mean, no, I don't know the exact number, but just around about hundreds, thousands. No, hundreds. I would say because it's, a, it's an everyday interaction with, uh, with tenants are looking for um, assistance in completing the application and submitting it. Um, so, you know, uh, many people are coming in because of, you know, because of the pandemic, people lost income and, 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 and as a result, they, they basically stopped paying the rent. So, but now they can get up to 12 months in, in, rent, in rent payment um, if, if they qualify for, the, for this program. Uh, not only, I'm sorry, not only the, the, the months that they didn't pay, but we could apply also to additional up to three months right. after that. Right. So wow. they, could, they could pay their rent until date, and then we could apply until up to three additional months right. for, that, for that assistance. Right. That's a, that's a great help to a, you know to a lot of people. It I know is. also uh, that we talk about children and uh, the advanced child tax uh, child tax care credit. Uh, so can you give us a little bit more information about how that works? Yeah. So like you said, uh, the child tax credit is an is a, is an advanced payment for those families with, with children that qualify for the, for the, for the, uh, for the child tax credit. So they can, res they, we, we can help them to submit basically, that's a very simple uh, application that, that we submit uh, via the, 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 the IRS website. Um, they can, a family can get uh, up to 3,600 per child. Uh, uh, let's say for example, uh, this year from July to December, they can get let's say up to 1800 per each child. And then for, uh, next year, when they file the taxes, they get the additional 1800 to complete the 3600 uh, for each child. So uh, it's, a, it's an advanced payment. Uh, people can get this advance, but if they don't want to get the advance this year, and they want to wait until next year to get the, the whole 3600 per child, they can do that too. But if they, if they decide to get this advance from here, from now to December, they can get per child eighteen hundred dollars, uh, and we can help them to uh, so submit the, the the application for that too. And this needs to be clear because some people are confused. They're thinking that it's so some sort of a stimulus or additional money. No, in this case, it's an advancement from your uh, child tax credit. So it's just like you're getting half of that credit in advance, and then you get the other half when you file your tax return next year. Yeah. Well, Oscar and uh, Christian, thank you so much. You guys are making a heck of a difference for Bronx residents and helping them to really get on their feet and really to advance uh, in a critical time. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Bronx Neighborhood Housing Services. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. All righty. Well, I want to let you know if you want more information, we encourage you to visit their website at bronxnhs.org and then also follow them on social media at bronxnhs. CDC. We do have more show coming up for you here on Open. We want you to stay with us. Open returns coming up right after this.
welcome back. In the United States, people have a lower life expectancy than other developed countries due to a variety of factors, including access to health care and lifestyle choices. Now, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield recently partnered with Montefiore and the New York City Parks for this year's second annual Bronx Fit Fest. Now, the event actually allowed the community to join free fitness and dance classes, as well as some sports clinics, healthy living tips, and wellness screenings. Here now to give us more details is the RN and Clinical Quality Program Director at Empire, Laura Brosen, and then Community Relations Manager at Montefiore Health, Jason Caraballo. And uh, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having, you for having me. I guess I'll begin with saying this is a wonderful partnership that's really addressed to dealing with some of the health disparities that we have uh, right here in the borough. And of course, uh, the second annual Bronx Fit Fest. And so for uh, people who may not have attended, uh, what did they miss? I, I'll start, Jason. Sure. It was a great event. It's just great to partner again, as you said, with Montefiore Medical Center and to be in the Bronx and the community to come together in a fun way to promote health and fitness. Um, and to just you know be all together again after being not together during COVID, and you know to have these fun dance events and nutrition and screenings and um, you know just be out in the community. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, I mean it's it was a great way to use public space um, in, in a way that we don't typically use it. Um, you know, here in the Bronx. It, the vast majority of families don't have access to their own private outdoor space. Um, and unfortunately, we're um, shut in for much of the pandemic. So now that we've begun to to reemerge um, from from the pandemic and return to some semblance of of pre COVID normalcy, um, it, it's important that we get out there and, and, and get physically active and leverage the public outdoor spaces that we have for that purpose. So, you know, it was really great to, to see that happen. When we talk about access, access is pretty huge here in the borough of the Bronx. Sometimes that access to health care really does not happen because people simply don't go. But in your way, uh, you had a chance to really bring it to them. How impactful is it to really bring wellness uh, to residents? That's a great point, uh, Jamie. So I think it's important to bring the wellness to the community, to give them access at this event, we had an opportunity for people to understand how they could sign up for healthcare if they didn't have it currently, how they could access free resources in the community. Uh, we had community partners uh, where, again, there were free resources that they may not know about. So I think it's important to understand how to connect to the resources that they might have and then how to find things that are available to them, whether it be through you know, the great uh, New York City Department of Parks, um, the city has a lot to offer through Montefiore Medical Center or through um, potentially a health plan like us at Empire. Yeah. And Jason, a little bit about the health screenings. I mean, how important is it for people to really be out there and take advantage of this? I mean, the, the importance of health screenings, you know, it, it can't be overstated. Um, you, you, you mentioned access and the, and the difficulty in access. There, there are tons of barriers to access that people in our communities face. Um, that that make it difficult for for them to to get these necessary screenings. So in in the event that people can't come to us for the healthcare that they need, we make it a priority to take healthcare to them um, where they are. And um, even if people do have access to a lot of these services, navigating it can sometimes be a significant challenge as well. So when we provide these screening services, we also have. Um, people who can help them navigate the system a little bit further should, should they need additional care or, or follow-up treatment. Yeah, and we know the Bronx really lags behind in the state as far as health, and uh, we know that we're not, the Not 62 campaign is out there really trying to improve uh, health outcomes for our residents. Uh, a part of health is also healthy eating, and I know that that was also a component uh, that you guys had out there helping people to live in a more healthy lifestyle when it comes to eating. That's right. Um, and so something like an example of what we had is smoothies. Everyone likes a smoothie. But for people who have diabetes, for example, too much fruit or carbohydrate could be a bad thing. So we had a nutritionist providing those smoothies with a recipe that goes with it that's friendly for diabetes to could show you how many calories and break it down and also have a discussion with the people at the event to understand how that could be a healthy part of a diabetes diet. Yeah. And so for you guys, after having an event such as this, 
What are some of the takeaways that you have after having this experience for the second time? Well, I, I think um, one major takeaway is that the, the public, our communities, they, they're interested in these kinds of things. Um, they're, they're interested in, in their own well-being, the well-being of their families and their neighbors, um, and making sure that they, they can stay um, healthy, um, particularly as we come out of this pandemic, I, I think that kind of brought it to the forefront of everyone's mind how important it is to be healthy. So recognizing that people have an interest in this and that there's demand for the services and information that we provide at events like this is really encouraging and you know just motivates us to do this work even, even further and more in depth. Yeah. Do you find that after somebody takes advantage of like a healthy day like this and people come out, they take advantage of the screenings and participate, that there is a follow up on the part of the people in terms of whether it's going to their local doctor or following up with some of the organizations that actually are out there on the ground? I, I think it's an increasing of an awareness as well. So maybe somebody didn't realize the signs and symptoms of diabetes or another disease and that they didn't see us or Montefiore as a resource in their community and they didn't know where to go or how to get started. Sometimes just getting started is the hard part. So I definitely think we see them following up and, and understanding how to take the first step. Yeah, Jason, I'll let you get in. I know you want to say something. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with everything um, she just said. Uh, it, you know, she's uh, right on point with it. Um, Initially, I guess when I personally started doing this work, I didn't think that there would be um, much follow up uh, on the part of the public, but I, I'm very happy to have been proven wrong. Um, when people connect to services that they realize are beneficial to them and their families, um, they, they follow up for sure. Um, they want to make sure that they're getting the full benefit of what's available to them. And for the both of you, I mean, after you have an event such as this, where do you go from here? I, th I think we, you know, we go back to our respective um, institutions and and see what we can do more of um, recognize the success um, that, that we've had with an event like this um, and, and just continue to build upon it. I think that's right. Montefiore and Empire are committed to partnering uh, in the Bronx uh, together to make more events like this happen. We're committed to improving the health. And as you mentioned, not 62 to, you know, these kind of events are small steps together in the community um, to giving them what they need. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll keep doing this as we go on. Yeah, Laura and uh, definitely Jason, thank you. Small steps lead to great outcomes. And so thank you for taking the small steps and really helping our community get more healthy and creating more health awareness. I want to thank Laura Brosen and Jason Cartabayo. Thank you for being with us here on Open. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. All righty now, if you want more information, we encourage you to visit the website at empireblue.com and montefiore.org. Well, we do have more show. We want you to stay with us. Open continues coming up after this. Founded in Israel with offices in New York City, Totals Medical Engineers Life-Saving Diagnostic Solutions for the early detection of a variety of cancers. Recently, they announced it received a notice of allowance from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for a trademark covering the company's protease inhibitor, oral antiviral drug candidate known as Tolivir. And joining us to share a little bit more details is the CEO of Totals Medical Ltd., Gerald Comision. And uh, Gerald, good to have you. Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So for people not so familiar with uh, Tolivir, uh, give us a little insight as to what Tolivir is all about. Sure. Um, Tolivir is really the product of around 20 years of research by my colleagues at NLC Pharma in Israel. Um, it is a plant extract 
um, that has been tested uh, and only a small percentage of the plants uh, in this category have this molecule in them that is a 3CL protease inhibitor. And so our special sauce is where we have an assay to figure out which lots of the plant root in question um, actually have this protease inhibitor. And what the protease inhibitor does um, is it stops the protease, it inhibits the protease, the 3CL protease. The 3CL protease is what uh, coronaviruses use to uh, cut themselves uh, in half after they've made replications and allow them to exit the cell to go infect other cells. And so what protease inhibitors do is they stop uh, the protease from causing the virus to divide. And they also stop uh, the protease from allowing the newly formed, any newly formed viruses to leave the cell. And so taken together, protease inhibitors really slow the replication of the virus, and they also slow the ability of the virus to go and infect other adjacent cells nearby. Yeah. And so when we talk about, you know, really research and really investment, a lot of time has been put into the vaccine. And I know uh, you'll make a case right now that there needs to be more investment, particularly when it comes to the antivirals. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it's it's very clear, you know, the vaccines provide tremendous benefit. They've they've done an extremely good job in terms of, you know, getting society open back up. With that being said, the new data that's coming out, you know, makes it very clear they don't last forever. And um, for those people who have compromised immune systems, whether that's because of age, whether that's because they have some underlying health conditions um, or some other reason that may not be immediately known because you know a lot of people only find out they have underlying health conditions when something happens to them and that something could be COVID-19 or COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you know, Because that protection doesn't last forever and it wears off, there does need to be something to support you know, the benefit of those vaccines. So for example, We've been hearing now that the Pfizer vaccine starts to lose its effectiveness starting at four months in certain people, and it becomes less and less effective to protect against infection over time. And recently, the FDA authorized booster shots to try and bring that level of protection back up. Well, realistically, you can't have booster shots every four months. And we don't even know if you do give booster shots every four months, whether that will improve uh, the immune levels uh, to a point where you will actually have protection against infection versus in protection against hospitalization and death. And so protease inhibitors are now being studied to help bolster protection against infection. Uh, they're also being studied once you are infected to reduce the severity of that infection so that the infection lasts a shorter period of time. Or it doesn't get so, and or it doesn't get so severe to go to the hospital. And if you are in the hospital because uh, you know you've had significant triggering of your immune system, or maybe the virus is replicating uncontrollably because you have an immune problem, uh, protease inhibitors are used to really slow that spread down at that stage of the game as well. So really, all along the chain from prophylactic to late stage therapeutic. Uh, protease inhibitors have a history of being able to help diseases such as uh, hepatitis, such as HIV. They've made those diseases manageable so people can live with them because they reduce the viral load. And here with COVID, we're taking a similar approach, but this is more of an acute condition. Uh, and so if you can really reduce you know, the replication over that short period of time, you lessen the ability of the virus to cause side effects and trigger cytokine storm, you lessen the likelihood of long COVID. So there are just a tremendous number of potential benefits with antivirals. Yeah. So what does it mean for you to be able to get this trademark for Tolivir? Well, for us, it's critical uh, because we have to make a distinction between uh, a couple of products that we have. We have Tolivir, which is currently in clinical trials in Israel, and we're preparing for clinical trials in India and clinical trials in the U.S. as really a kind of a pharmaceutical grade product um, that's going to be going after uh, claims as a botanical drug. However, we do have a dietary supplement version that is you know, lower dose, 
um, that has been authorized by the FDA for immune support and also has been granted the claim that it is a 3CL protease inhibitor and an immune support uh, function uh, compound. And we call that tolovid. So for us, you know, tolovir, the pharmaceutical, we want to make sure that people understand when we talk about tolovir and all the benefits that that's limited to the pharmaceutical side. And uh, we can create that distinction with Tolovid, which is kind of a mass market product. We recently got approval to launch that on Amazon. We're not making any claims about its utility in COVID-19. However, it is an immune support product. And so that distinction now being granted by uh, the USPTO is important as we market these two products with their separate and distinct claims. Yeah. Can you show us a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing? I know that some things include uh, developing blood tests for uh, early detection of cancer, as well as uh, Alzheimer's disease. That's right. That's right. So the, the company, you know, before COVID was around, we, we were very focused on diagnostics and cancer and Alzheimer's, and we're continuing there. So we have a blood test uh, that we acquired through the acquisition of a company called ProVista Diagnostics. It's called Videsa. It's been validated, has been on the market previously in the US um, to help women with dense breasts um, who have inconclusive mammograms when they typically go to uh, their mammogram, their semi-annual mammogram. This will allow them to take a blood test instead of taking additional imaging and potentially a biopsy. Um, a blood test would tell them, you know, yes, no, we think that it's likely you have cancer. And so you need to go to these additional tests or no, you know, you really don't have cancer. The uh, imaging just wasn't that uh, successful for you because of your physiology, not because of, you know, what's going on inside of you. And this blood test will, you know, improve the accuracy of uh, mammograms so that women with dense breasts, you know, can, can get answers faster and go about living their lives. It reduces biopsy need by about 45% based on our data. Got a lot happening. So for people who want to stay connected and find out a little bit more about what you're doing, how do they go about doing that? Uh, you can go to our website, www.todosmedical.com. You know, we talk there about uh, our neutralizing antibody tests, CPAS that we run, all of our PCR testing that we're doing at ProVista, as well as our innovative testing with Videsa for uh, breast cancer, Limpro for Alzheimer's, and our you know, overall AI cancer platform, TBIA. And then obviously, you know, our protease inhibitor programs, both on the testing side with what we call Tolo Test, uh, the supplement side with Tolovid, and the uh, pharmaceutical grade with Tolovir. Uh, Gerald, a lot going on. Thank you so much. For it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for sharing with us here on Open. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Now, if you want more information, we encourage you to follow them on Twitter and Facebook at Totos Medical. Well, we've got more show. Don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up in a few. struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit, or call toll free at 833-511-0311. That's 833- 5110311. And welcome back to the show. Though things are slowly returning to a new normal, equitable access to the internet outside the classroom remains critically important. The New York Yankees Diversity and Inclusion Committee recently announced a program in partnership with T-Mobile to benefit New York City Department of Education students. Now, Project 10 Million is an initiative aimed at delivering internet connectivity to millions of underserved student households at no cost to them. Joining us now to share more details is the National Education Administrator at T-Mobile, Dr. Keisha King. And uh, Dr. Keisha, good to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. I appreciate it. 
this has got to be a, a great win for students and, of course, for families, because when we talk about the digital divide, particularly in urban neighborhoods, uh, sometimes people don't recognize just how far behind urban neighborhoods are in just real accessibility. So what does this program mean for you? You're absolutely right. And I can tell you as a, you know, a former student growing up in, in an underrepresented area, this program really hits home for me. And I'm really excited to be able to lead education for T-Mobile's um, $10.7 billion Project 10 Million Initiative. The real goal is to make sure that we're providing student connectivity to 10 million students across the country. Um, and that critical connectivity, of course, is filtered through you know, our CIPA um, Child Internet Protection Act uh, uh, filter to make sure that kids are surfing safely. Um, we've also launched a, another component of this initiative that is really critical, and that's what we're doing with the New York Yankees. So it's really a goal of connecting these uh, tens of thousands of students to say, how do we make sure that we're really solving this in a way that is real? Um, and the program is available one per student household based on eligibility for the National School Lunch Program to students all over the country. Wow. And so when we talk about this, students will actually have the opportunity to have their own hotspots, correct? Yeah, they will. They'll receive a free hotspot and unlimited internet access for one full year of service. Ah, so how does a student become actually eligible for this? So with this particular program, um, you know, students have returned to the classroom and COVID-19 just continues to impact them and hinder, hinder their access to devices and reliable internet. And I think the Yankees um, partnering with T-Mobile have really done something amazing. Through their donation of $1 million, they're really seeking to provide this free internet to over 11,000 students all over the Bronx um, for one full year. And the real goal of this project is just to solve for this digital equity divide. You know, we have students all over the country where they can sit and just Google a random thought, right? And what better is it than our students to sit and say, hey, I'm thinking of what does Rome look like? And I can interact in a virtual classroom, right? They're gaining academic vocabulary and real opportunities to share with one another and to impact the world, just like their other peers do. Yeah, but you know, I think sometimes when we talk about the digital divide, many people are really not so aware as to how bad it is. And I talked about this in the, in the intro, uh, particularly in urban neighborhoods, when you think that access to resources is equitable, the fact of the matter is that's just not true. That's very true. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's one story of a school counselor in Renton, Washington, you know, shared about her experience when everything shifted online. She became concerned when several families failed to show up for their scheduled Zoom conferences. And she got on her mask and got in her car to visit those families to find out, you know, why they weren't there. And the real issue was this reliable connectivity. Right. When parents couldn't log into meetings and students were using their parents' cell phones to try to keep up with remote learning. And I think we're still in some of that situation today. It's really heartbreaking to know that, you know, throughout the pandemic, many students and families were able to access only able to access health care because someone provided Internet access to that child. They were only able to access government resources and, you know, um, and assistance programs because that child was provided with that internet access. That is the part that's really critical to this conversation. We're working to drive communities forward through providing this critical access to the students as well. Yeah, and you know, you talk about that teacher going out there really finding out how bad it is for students. I mean, from a teacher's perspective, you got the whole homework initiative and the fact that I may not be able to see my student do their homework. For a student on the other hand, not being able to do homework, the consequences are bad grades and, you know, possibly a poor outcome. But I know that what you want to do is really be able to bridge that homework gap uh, in a major kind of way. You're very right. And T-Mobile's goal is to really help eliminate the digital divide. And, you know, when we thought about this, we really took a, a wide angle lens to how we want to solve for this. And that's why the program seeks to connect 10 million students. Any family can walk into a T-Mobile store today with their National School Lunch Program letter and receive a free hotspot based on eligibility for their household with 100 gigs of high-speed internet access per year for five full years. Think about that senior that's in school that's pursuing post-secondary education at the local community college. 
right? If they receive that hotspot, they now have internet access for five years at 100 gigs per year, right? Whether you're sitting on a city bus or you're on the side of the field at the YMCA, right? Or you're sitting in front of mom's job in the break room waiting for her to get off work. Internet access is not only about sitting in one place having access to the internet. It's about being mobile. It's about having the same mobility and access as your peers do, right? Your, your peers that are more fluent right? Being able to sit down and Google that random thought, like I mentioned, and, you know, look up learning resources and just look at the world of possibilities online. If you want to fix your bike, you can YouTube how to do that. That's something that you normally wouldn't have access to do if you don't have internet access. And that's really what this program seeks to provide. What does it mean having the New York Yankees as a partner, the Bronx Bombers? For those of us in the borough of the Bronx, we're pretty excited that our team is a uh really stepping up to bat, pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah, that part is probably the most exciting part of all. We've worked very closely with New York Department of Education and done some great work to connect students all over New York City. And now this is a, a new partnership with the New York Yankees where they've said, hey, we wanna take this $1 million and provide free internet to 11,000 students across the Bronx. Imagine what that does for the, the community. Right now you're empowering all these other sectors beyond education to make these students and these families be successful for one full year. And I think, you know, just thinking about the Yankees commitment to success for students and their commitment to really solving for this um, in alignment with T-Mobile's already committed to do, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. So if people want to find out more information, how they go about, you know, getting connected and yeah, getting connected. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, this program is available through any T-Mobile store. You can access Project 10 Million. You can also visit the website at Project 10 Million. I'm sorry, T-Mobile.com slash Project 10 Million or P10M. Uh, and you enter in a few points of information. Um, there is no credit check, no um extreme validation. We want to make sure that every single family has access to this program who is eligible. Um, the issue of the, the digital divide has existed far before the pandemic. And this is something that we're seeking to resolve far after the pandemic is over. T-Mobile has committed this $10.7 billion, and we're excited to partner with the Yankees to connect even more students. Well, Dr. Keisha King, thank you so much. I think it means so much to students, uh, but not just the students, but the families and also educators to really bridge this gap that is really, a lot of people sometimes don't know about, but we're making people more aware. And thanks for the work that T-Mobile is doing to help to do that. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you so much, Darren. Appreciate it. All righty. Well, I want to tell you that if you want more information, what you do, you can visit the website at tmobile.com forward slash project 10 million. There you get all the information on how to get connected. Well, we've come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. And most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you missed any part of our show, of course, you're welcome to catch the Recablecast on Broxess Channel 67. Also, if you have Verizon Files, that would be Channel 2133. Or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Also want to thank our watchers, who are viewers, I should say, who are watching uh, on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. Now, if you want a brand new episode of Open, we encourage you to come back on Friday morning. My girl, Rena Valentine will bring you the best in arts and entertainment. Until then, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless. Most of all, keep this channel wide open.